as I was looking through the bulletin this morning, um, I was reminded with all of these Easter lilies of the list of folks in whose memories they have been given. I have too many people in my own memories, in my own list of those who I've loved and lost, including my father about a year ago, and uh, these are good reminders. But I also was thinking about my friend Harry. Harry died a few years back. Uh, he thought he was unusually blessed and thought he might have somehow along the way gotten some cat DNA infused into his blood. He thought that because he had had so many challenges to his life that he really believed he had nine lives. Finally, the cancer got him. But he said to me at one point, he said to me, you know, I used to go golfing quite often. Me and my buddies, we'd go golfing quite often, especially in our retirement. He said, we don't go golfing anymore. There aren't enough of us. He said, instead, we go to the coffee shop and we sit there and we talk about funerals because we go to funerals more often than we go golfing. I said, what do you talk about, Harry? Well, he said, that's the funny thing. He said, we sit around the table and we talk and my friends say to me, hmm, what'd you think of that funeral? And then we compare notes to see whether it was a good funeral or a bad funeral. But my friends started saying, well, what do you want the minister to say at your funeral? What would you like him to say when it's your time? And one of my friends said, you know, when it's time for me, I, I want the minister to say, he was a, he was a good man and he, he loved his family and he did well in business and he was just a pillar of the community. That's what I'd like him to say. And another fellow at the table said, yeah, I'd like him to say, he was a man of faith and he believed in Jesus and he knew that this wasn't the end for him. He read his Bible and he prayed. Yeah, that's what I'd like him to say. And then they look at me, you know, and Harry says to me, they ask me, well, Harry, what do you want them to say at the funeral? He said, well, you know, when they come to the church and my casket is there and it's open and they all file by, I want them to go, whoa, he just moved. Because nobody wants to die. You don't want to die. I don't want to die. My uncle Lambert was a grave digger. He was a farmer too, but he couldn't farm well enough that he could earn a living at it, so he was a grave digger as well. Uh, earned him a, a bunch of money because in our community in Minnesota, people were always dying. I don't know if that's true in other places, but it was true there. So he was a grave digger, and it was a kind of community where they didn't like to have backhoes come into the cemeteries. So instead, they had the graves dug by hand. And he had in the back of his old pickup truck a number of sharp spades and pickaxes so he could dig down, and he was very proud. He oiled them after he finished every grave, and, and they were as clean as could be, but they, they, they were very straight so that he could dig down and make it really a clear grave, you know, the kind that you imagine. And he used to tell stories about that, you know, stories about uh, the young guy who was going across town late at night in the dark and trying to get home and decided to take a shortcut through the cemetery and as he was going there he fell into an open newly dug grave and the uh, sides of the grave were so straight that he couldn't claw his way out and from the other end of the grave he heard a voice saying you'll never get out of here and he did My uncle used to sometimes, when the grave was near finished, and I was there with him, it, he would uh, have his ladder in there, and he'd say, come, come on down here, I, I, need, I need you to ex inspect this grave. And so, you know, like the fool that I am, I would go down into the grave, and then he'd pull up the ladder. Uh, <laughs> I did manage to get out of a few graves. The reality, though, on Easter morning is that we have to talk about death and dying and about graves because this is what it's all about. In fact, it was so strongly what it was all about 
that one of the questions the congregation in a town called Corinth in the Mediterranean Sea on Greece, uh, you know where the mainland of Greece connects with that sort of almost big island on the south end, we call it the Peloponnese, right there there's a city named Corinth, it still exists today. And the Apostle Paul, one of the early apostles of Jesus, was telling the people there about Jesus' life and death and resurrection. And then he moved on to another church, and about 19 years after Jesus had died and come back to life, they sent him a letter, and they asked him a bunch of questions, and one of their questions was this. You keep talking about how because of God's love, because of what Jesus has done, our sins are forgiven and we don't have to endure death forever. And yet some people are dying. What's going to happen to them? So in 52 AD, Paul sent a letter to them, and part of that letter is on your orders of service here today. This is what Paul says in response to their questions about death and dying and Jesus' own death and resurrection. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. When my grandpa died, the funeral home in Clara City, Minnesota, was kind of a makeover old house with creaking floors, and the parlor was sort of the place where it used to be a living room, and the, um, the stuff that was the mechanics of it all was hidden behind in what had been the kitchen. We all try to sanitize death and make it into something that it's not. When we gathered to view Grandpa's body for the first time, he was one of the first in my life that I've experienced um, to have died. I remember looking at his body in the casket and thinking that this doesn't look like Grandpa. This doesn't look like the man I knew. And I remember as I was standing there, my Uncle Lambert, the grave digger, was standing right next to me. And then, and then, and then something happened which is really inappropriate. Because the embalming fluid began to leak out of the corner of Grandpa's mouth. And it was funny. But it wasn't. It was tragic. And Uncle Lambert saw Grandma over there and said quickly, get her out of here, get her out of here, because we don't want to imagine that death actually happens and the stuff that goes on in our lives. 
nor did the people who knew Jesus expect that of his life. After all, hadn't he raised people from the dead? There's the story in John chapter 11 of Jesus raising Lazarus, his friend who had died. Jesus seemed full of power, full of life. Nothing could defeat him. He even managed in various times to cast out demons and to, to uh, open the eyes of the blind. Couldn't he have done anything to prevent those soldiers from taking him? Couldn't he have done something to prevent this early demise to one so promising? And yet Jesus died. And yet Jesus died. What Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, as we read today, is that because Jesus came back to life on Easter morning, we get four gifts. We get four gifts. And the first of those is we get back Jesus himself. This is an astounding thing. There are some places in the Gospels and in the book of Acts where different groups among the Jewish people of the first century argue with one another about whether there are spirits and demons, whether there are angels, whether there's a spiritual realm, or if, in fact, what you see is what you get. And some of those who said, yes, there's more, were called the Pharisees. And the Pharisees believed not only that there was a spiritual realm, but they also believed that God was so powerful that one day at the end of time, God would raise to life all who were part of his family. They truly believed this. But no one, not the Pharisees and not the Sadducees, believed that generally and even atypically, people who die get back to life. And that was the most astounding thing about Easter morning that the person who died came back to life. That the one whose life had fled from his veins and from his muscles and from his tissues, that one came back alive again. It was astounding, it was so hard to conceive of. In fact, Luke tells us that that same Sunday afternoon, when Jesus in the morning had gotten out of the grave, there were a couple of people who had great hopes in him who were walking along from Jerusalem to Emmaus, just a few miles down the road, and they were talking and they were wondering and they were shaking their heads. They couldn't believe these things that had taken place. And as they were walking, says Luke, Jesus suddenly appeared on the road. They didn't see him come up to them, but suddenly he was walking next to them. And they started to tell him what was going on because he didn't seem to know anything about it. He was clueless. And as they talked with him about these things, he said, oh, I understand, I understand. They were shaking their heads. They were mourning that this one with so much promise was dead and gone. And then he said to them, Let's think about this. And he took them through the whole journey of the Bible, from beginning to where they were now. How God had intended a world of good where human beings could be the crown of all living things, where we would engage with one another and with the environment around us in peace and harmony. And because of the temptations of evil, we had become cloudy and darkened. We had turned into less than the persons we truly are. And so along the way, God had kept calling out, calling out through prophets and teachers, calling out through the faith community of Israel. God still lives. God still loves you. God still matters, and so do you. And finally said Jesus to these people who didn't even know it was Jesus, that in these last times, God had sent God's own person God's own son, God's own participant in the creation event and become one among us. And this was to defeat death so that we might live. As they were going to Emmaus, Jesus looked like he was going to carry on. But he didn't. The people said, why don't you join us for supper? It's about that time. So he came into the house and washed his hands. And as they sat at the table, they said to him, why don't you bless the bread? and break it. Jesus took the loaf and he broke it. And when he had given thanks, he disappeared from their sight. And they said, whoa, we just saw Jesus. 
And they ran back to Jerusalem to tell everybody about it. Since that time, we've been telling everybody, Jesus is alive. The one who died came back to life again. So Jimmy Owens, our God is far greater than words can make known. Exalted and holy, he reigns on his throne. In infinite splendor, he rules over all. Yet he feeds the poor sparrows, and he knows when they fall. His power is great and will ever endure. His wisdom is peaceable, gentle and pure. But greater than all these glories I see is the glorious promise that he cares for me. And how do we know the care of Jesus? How do we know the love of God? We know it most powerfully in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the dead, promising that we serve a risen Savior. What does Easter give back to us? It gives us back Jesus. The second thing, says Paul, that Easter gives back to us is one another. One another. Those who have died too soon and are gone. Those who we've lost those who have been taken away by the bombs of the explosions this morning in the churches of Sri Lanka, by the wars, by the diseases, by the car accidents, by old age. I say to my students sometime, you're invincible. And they all nod because they know they are. They are as invincible as Marvel comic characters. There is nothing that can defeat them or prevent the next installment from being made. They will live forever. Except they don't. Except they don't. My friend Charlie in high school didn't live forever. My best friend Bart's sister was working on a road crew, holding the flag that had slowed down, but she was standing on the highway this way. She was standing this way. There's the east. And a car coming from the west was blinded by the morning light, never slowed. And at a very young age, she was gone. My wife's younger brother found that life was too difficult for him and took his life. My parents died in the past couple of years, and my father-in-law and they're gone too soon. My dad was a young 93 years old, and he still had at least 117 years left to live. But he died. And we miss them. I keep thinking, while my wife calls her mom, I should call my dad. I should call my mom. But they're not here. They're gone, and I can't anymore. And what Easter says according to the word of Scripture, according to the testimony of Paul, is that we who die will not remain in the grave. We too will come alive by faith in Jesus and by the power of the Spirit and by the work of God. One day we too will rise and the resurrection is the great thing that's preached to all people. We who live are meant to live. And those who die, it is unfortunate, but it will not remain that way. We will see one another once again. And that brings us to the third thing. It's not only those that we have lost that we will see again one day, but we ourselves have a promise for life as we are. You know, who were the disciples apart from Jesus? There's that story in the Gospels where at one point, because of the words of Jesus being a little bit harsh and, and challenging, many people were told left Jesus. They walked away. And then Jesus looked at his 12 disciples, those who were closest to him. And he said to them, well, you going to go too? And what did Peter say? Lord, to whom shall we go? You are the one who has the words of eternal life. In other words, apart from Jesus, we ourselves are nothing. We think sometimes that we will live forever, perhaps at least in the memories of those who have loved us and are sorry that we're gone. There was a preacher in Philadelphia who did a rousing 
um, testimony time. It was between Christmas and New Year, and many of the younger members of the church who had gone to work or to study in other places came home. And so they had this kind of reunion at the holiday season. So he would get them on the Sunday between Christmas and, and New Year's uh, on the platform of the church. He would line them up and, and he would ask them, he'd pass the microphone down, you know, tell, tell people who you are and what you're doing and, and how much you miss us. And so they would give their testimonies about, about what was going on in their lives, what they were doing and what they were experiencing. And then he had this little sermonette only about 45 minutes long or so, but he had this little talk that he gave to them. And he said something to the effect of this. Folks, you're out there, and you're working on getting your titles. You're trying to get your BA, and you're trying to get your MA, and you're trying to get your PhD. You're looking for titles, CEO. You're looking to be the top dog. You're looking to get the top name. You're looking to get top billing. You're looking to be someone. But folks, let me tell you, one day, and it's not that far into the future, you're going to die. And they're going to take you out to the cemetery, and they're going to throw some, grave on, some dirt on your face, and they're going to walk back to the church and have ham buns and potato salad. <laughs> and then the question is, then the question is, when that happens, will there be more people who are crying than are laughing? You know that when you came into this world, your mom was crying. She was crying but there were lots of people who were laughing. It's a girl, it's a boy. And you know the difference at the end of your life is whether you have a title or a testimony. Now he said, now he said, back at the early times, you know, there was Pharaoh and he had a title. And there was Moses and he had a testimony. And, and there was that time when Ahab had a title, king. And there was little old Elijah, but he had a testimony. Oh, and then came that time when there was, there was Pilate, and he had a title. But Jesus, he had a testimony. I want to say to you that if you want to be somebody in this world, go ahead, get your titles, but don't. Forget your testimony. Who are you when push comes to shove and when death comes knocking on the door? All the titles in the world won't make a difference. They'll put you out in the cemetery and throw some dirt on your face and go back to the church and have some ham buns and potato salad. But if you have a testimony, you know my Redeemer lives. And so will I. What does Easter give back to us? It gives back Jesus. And it gives back those that we've loved and lost. But it gives us back ourselves. Not in some silly way of remembering which lasts for maybe a decade at most and then even those who remember us are no longer being remembered by others because they're gone. Who remembers those of the past? nor some kind of reincarnation way. What significance would that have? Aren't you you? Don't you want to be you? Didn't God make you to be the person you are? Then if in fact some small spiritual element of you transmigrates into another fleshly creature, it's that person, it's not you. But God, God intended for you to be the person you are. And God loved you so much that God has said, I will never allow anything, not even death itself, to snatch this person from me. And that's the fourth thing, really, that Paul talks about here. We are not to be pitied because we have life for now and for the future. The resurrection of Easter Sunday gives us hope. 
The playwright Henrik Ibsen, not Henry Gibson, Hendrik Ibsen, the Danish playwright, was a debater, and one of his favorite words was nevertheless. Nevertheless. He could use it in arguments to counter his opponent's ideas. So much so, and that was rooted in his faith, that when he died, his last word was nevertheless. And on his grave, that is the word etched in stone, nevertheless. James Young Simpson was a doctor in Glasgow, no, Edinburgh. And he had a daughter who died at a young age. Now, we know um, James Young Simpson for something uh, that many of us have blessed our doctors about. He actually invented chloroform, but anesthesiologists have helped us through many surgeries by giving us stuff so that we don't remember how badly we hurt or what happened to us. And when he was near the end of his life, his daughter had died, and he had put on her gravestone that word, nevertheless. Near the end of his life, his students at the U University Medical School asked him, thinking he would talk about chloroform, they asked him what his greatest treasure was, his greatest thing in life. And he told them that it was the resurrection of Jesus, for it meant that one day, someday, he would see his daughter again. Students recently have been asking me to fill out forms for recommendations for their summer jobs, including that of being camp personnel, counselors, workers at various camps, Spring Hill up north, other camps around along the Lake Michigan shore. And it reminded me of that story about Mary, who had been the cook at a really significant youth camp for virtually all her life. She was the head chef. Her menu was the thing that the, uh, everybody who came to camp ate, and they loved her for it because she had really good food. And she treated them all with great respect, first as a young person, and then as she grew older, sort of as a mother, and then as a grandmother. And she had this, this wonderful way of helping people, you know, move on. Sometimes when they gather for meals, then they linger too long or they don't know what to do. Uh, she would come out uh, as people were still busy with their eating and, and they were making all sorts of ruckus and noise in these places that don't have, have very much for sound uh, dampening. And then she would come out with her fork and she would hold it up. And she would say, okay, okay, everybody. And people would quiet down. She'd say, time now to get your dishes off to the counter over there so we can wash them. One person at each table gather the plates. One person at each table gather the rest of the cup cutlery. One person gather the cups. Bring them all over there. But keep your forks. The best is yet to come. And then they'd bring all their stuff over there. They'd come back and hold their forks high because they knew she had a terrific dessert planned. So much so that when she died and thousands came because of their years of relationship with her, on her casket, they put a fork. The best is yet to come. And you know it. Pray with me. We are grateful, Jesus, for the love that you provide us. The forgiveness we gain from Good Friday's cross. And the resurrection hope that is ours because you came back to life on Easter Sunday. Allow us to know with confidence that we serve a risen Savior. Allow us to enjoy the memories of those who have died and left us behind, but we loved and cherished and to carry forward their times and their values with us. Allow us to live in expectation that we are loved so much that even if disease ratchets at our body, even if old age sometimes makes us frail, or if we are in the prime of our lives and football quarterbacks, and cheerleaders, and the best of the best. Though we die, we will live. Keep in us 
alive that hope of the resurrection. For we are yours, and we believe in you.